Picking a favorite in any sort of medium is a difficult thing for me. I feel a need to rationalize my choices to myself, and it would result in a lot of back and forth in my own mind. I would tend to think, oh maybe this is my favorite, only to immediately challenge that notion and ask myself, is it really that good? In terms of anime specifically, I've watched many other shows where I had developed deep and personal connections. Whether that's due to nostalgia, or whether it's just something that happened to come to me at the right time in my life. But a lot of my interests in these series would fade and I would gain different perspective. One of the very few outliers though, would be a little 12 episode series from 2015. It's a show I find myself revisiting very often, and found myself continually enjoying while also gaining a deeply rooted respect. These moments still somehow haven't released the grasp they have on me. Some of these rewatches were even solely to challenge my perspective, and despite that, I still found myself gaining more investment and more respect for it. I love anime. <laughs> that somehow wasn't apparent. And this show is an example of why I appreciate the medium so much. While it may be extremely difficult to convey to you all of the reasons it resonates with me, that's what I'd like to attempt to do. Also, I know it's important to look at things through an objective lens, but I will ultimately have to concede to my extreme biases. I want the respect and love I feel for this show to be laid out for anyone who wants to try and understand it. So without any further delay, Gakko Garashi, my favorite anime. <laughs> One of my fondest memories of Gakko Garashi goes back as early as simply finding it. The minuscule act of discovering the show was a memorable experience in itself. Whilst browsing around my favorite meme trash anime group on Facebook, I came across a video clip. A clip that was, um, confusing, yet intriguing. As soon as I witnessed this, I had to immediately check out the show to fully understand the context. Now this clip I'm referring to was, uh, a, a spoiler. <laughs> and easily the most iconic moment from the show. With that said, we're going to talk about that. The good news is it happens in the first episode, so if you want to avoid this moment being ruined for you, I suggest just watching that first uh, episode. <laughs> now you might be asking yourself, is this guy really suggesting I just blindly watch an episode of some show I know nothing about? Well, yeah, actually. <laughs> if I didn't, I could be possibly robbing you of the experience the show is so well known for. But, but okay, fine, I'll give you uh, a quick synopsis before I move on. Gakko Garashi is a moe anime based on the premise of its small cast of cute girls being part of the school living club. What does this club do you ask? Well they, they live in the school. But that's not all the show is about. Gakko Garashi delves in many exciting themes such as coping mechanisms, codependence, and post-traumatic stress. I'd obviously like to elaborate more but there's something I'm obviously trying not to address. So just trust me, it may look like something you don't want to watch, but give the entirety of episode 1 a look and consider pausing here and coming back. Anyway, if you know anything about this show, you're well aware of what I'm alluding to. And for those who don't care about spoiling the premise, just promise not to hate me. <gasps> Senpai! Gakko Garashi is a moe anime based on the premise of its small cast barricading themselves in their school due to a zombie outbreak. It's about this group trying to keep a hopeful attitude in the face of tragedy, and is about many fun subjects such as coping mechanisms, codependence, and uh, you know. In reference to post-traumatic stress specifically, we should address this girl with the funny hat, Yuki Takia. You see, the series' main hook is that while this is what's actually happening, Yuki does not see it that way. From her perspective, the incident never happened. She has repressed painful memories and has created a false reality in her mind. Which leads into episode 1's final moments revealing that the previous 20 minutes we sat through was that false reality. See, the hardest thing about recommending Gakko Garashi to anybody is you either have to force them to watch it blind or risk ruining the first episode's bait and switch. At the same time though, I've never been quite as excited to show someone a single episode of anime. 
You see, it's not just the fact that this show pulls this twist on the viewer, but this first episode presents one of my favorite aspects about Gakko Garashi, its attention to detail. As previously mentioned, I have rewatched this series countless times, and despite that, I'm still noticing many little hints sprinkled throughout. The foreshadowing isn't always subtle, but for every obvious hint, there may be several tiny ones. And this first episode is possibly the most condensed example of this. We begin watching without the knowledge of what's to come, but as the episode progresses, things just seem slightly odd. But instead of ignoring weird plot points, such as the fact that they're living in the school, they address some of them and give reasons for why they could all feasibly make some sort of sense. They live in the school because that's the show's premise, a club that lives on school grounds. Kurumi always has this shovel, but then we find her later on the roof where the garden is, implying that's why she has it. And even things that aren't explained can be excused by common tropes and limitations of other shows in similar genres and settings. Using these featureless background characters is my favorite example. What is normally used as a result of budgetary or time restrictions has an intentional and effective reason for existing. But after making it through the first episode, you probably noticed the more obvious foreshadowing, like this shot of the broken window and the cross on the roof. But did you notice this crowd of people in these awkwardly hunched over positions? After reaching the conclusion, do you recall this seemingly unimportant dialogue about Yuki almost going home? It's moments like these that have not only strengthened my investment, but also my respect for the show. And trust me, we're not finished after only episode one. There are events further down the line that become more unsettling when you notice seemingly minute details upon reflection. There are moments where my heart would sink after discovering something that was new information to me, yet was always present. That's when I would think back to previous episodes and find myself feeling an overwhelming emotional cocktail of dread and sadness. Obviously, I don't want to point out specific moments to keep your experience unspoiled, but even with the knowledge of what's to come, thinking I knew all there is to know about the show, on my most recent rewatch, I found myself curious about something, pausing, rewinding, turning up the volume, and f freezing up as I realized the number of footsteps I was actually hearing. And that's just a small moment. When a scene is laid out to more bluntly convey something shocking, unsettling, or heartbreaking, I gain an additional level of respect for the show's visual design and music. Gaka Garashi uses these particular tools of the medium to fantastic use. That's not to say the manga lacks in visual intensity during these moments, but Studio Lurch put a lot of creative flair into enhancing these particular moments. Whether it be to bathe a shot in shadows, heavily emphasize specific colors, or present a shot that just encourages the viewer's imagination to take the wheel. Speaking of that, I actually do appreciate the presentation of the zombies, when they're not CGI at least. <laughs> Studio Lurch made the decision to either mask the zombies in shadows, or smear this sort of black mist over them. It not only makes Gakko Garashi more accessible for people who don't really care for gore, but I feel it also makes this show's few intimate encounters more unnerving. The imagination has the ability to conjure up more disturbing imagery than what may be possible to draw, one exception being when you create something so grossly detailed that it disturbs on sight. See Junji Ito's work. But I feel when it's not committed to one of these two extremes, it can lose its effect it's intending to have on the viewer. See the anime adaptation of Junji Ito's work. <clears throat> anyway, by just exposing the viewer to specific key visual elements while taking away a lot of imagery, it effectively leaves me to create this image and piece together what's happening. And you know what, honestly, it's interesting just to see how well these concepts align with Gakko Garashi's deeply rooted themes. The metric ton of cute touches in the visual design are littered throughout the show. This decision to make these distracting aesthetics look cheap and paper-like is something I interpret to be a direct parallel to what's happening in the narrative. A cast of young girls trying to distract themselves with blissful optimism, as the apocalypse sits right on the other side of the barrier. It's also more than fair to say these touches aren't limited to only the visual design of the show. I've come to realize similar design concepts are all over Gakko Garashi's soundtrack. The 
The OST to the show is fantastic. It ranges from high energy and fun to hollow and depressing. While there is a heavy use of piano, there's actually a decent amount of variety in the instrumentation behind a lot of these tracks. And despite a few outliers, there's a general theme, a more empty and minimalistic touch. Something I feel expertly conveys a lot of Gakogarashi's themes. Even the more chipper songs feel like they're missing something, or that they're just kind of off. While still sounding distinctly upbeat, these tracks are kind of empty and simple. Some of these more innocent songs also have a direct counterpart using a leitmotif, taking this original melody and either presenting it in a more depressing way, or straight up distorting it. I actually love a lot of songs on this side of the soundtrack in particular. There's a vibe of fading innocence, coldness, and isolation. My favorite example and quite possibly my favorite track in the entire OST being Kayaku no Naka no Keshiki. What I absolutely love about this track is it sounds like half of the song is absent, yet the missing pieces properly conveys the bleakness of the current circumstances. And even though it sounds as if it's a hopeless track overall, I sort of interpret these individual keys popping up in the overwhelming silence to be glimmers of hope, a small light in the darkness suggesting that something is still alive. I could go on and on and on about the OST specifically, but I realize I've been going on for quite a bit while only discussing the aesthetic pieces to the anime, but these elements would mean nothing if Gakogarashi had no strong foundation to it. Fortunately, this show is carried upon the shoulders of its extremely likable and endearing cast, with deep development for each and every single for nearly every character. I'm so sorry, Yuri. But one or two characters not getting their chance to shine aside, the show dedicates its first half of its runtime into its cast more personal stories, how they came to unite, and how they play off one another. I tend to appreciate stories that put a lot of focus into establishing who its characters are, and I deeply appreciate the adaptation for spending more time doing so than the manga. Speaking of that, Kurumi, Megane, and Miki have entire episodes dedicated to development, while Yuki and Yori have their own moments kind of throughout the series. While the manga does handle specific elements of this better, such as handling Yori's character, the adaptation offers more insight into more characters as a whole. We gain more of an understanding in Kurumi's struggle with morality despite feeling she's the only one who can do what she does. Miki wasn't initially present in the manga, and because the anime decided to begin with her as part of the group, we're able to understand who she is before discovering the emotional distress she endured. Megane's additional development was one of, if not the biggest improvement to the narrative. It emphasized how important she is to the group and why she matters so much. We also got some nice personal moments between her and specific characters that weren't originally present. Ah, oh, they didn't have to do that, but that's nice. I got a genuine feeling that these characters filled roles and had perspectives that mattered. And despite Yuki and Yori not having entire episodes with them in the focus, they are always important pieces to the puzzle. Interestingly enough, Yuki and Yori have a sort of parallel between one another. Yuki serves the purpose of keeping everyone's spirits up and is essentially the glue that holds everyone together. On the flip side, Yuri has to maintain a cool and collected front while keeping an eye on their resources and making sure everything is running smoothly. While very different, they are pretty comparable when you realize they both can't keep this charade up forever. Both of them slowly break down in their own ways as the series progresses. In fact, all of the characters have their own unique struggles and moments of weakness. There's a large variety of feelings I have for these moments, ranging from something as small as pity to genuine heartbreak and concern. One thing you'll also notice is the show is honestly more focused on the companionship between its characters more than any horror elements, and I put the word horror in quotation marks because, despite Gakogarashi occasionally filling me with a sense of unease or dread more than any actual horror anime has, it uses horror elements as a tool to enhance or play off our attachment to these characters. 
The anime has a fair share of intense and creepy scenes, but it has more instances of our characters just having fun with this heavy moe aesthetic draped over everything. And about that, I think it's a good time to talk about the moe influence the show uses, as it's kind of a divisive topic among fans and critics. While I would hesitate to call Gakugarashi a complete deconstruction of the moe genre, it does feel like it has something to say about moe. One of the biggest and more immediately obvious elements is that it's using this aesthetic and mood to distract us from what's happening. Much like Yuki's delusional state, it's a distraction from reality. It's trying its hardest to make things fun and cute, all the while we know what's going on is anything but. However, the show also does relish in these moments a bit, keeping our characters' engagements fun and interesting. Whether it's Kurumi making fun of Yuki's drawings or how differently the characters eat, these are important little insights that develop these characters further and make them feel more like real and unique people. Even though I feel some of these brighter moments drag on a bit too long, sometimes for entire episodes in fact, they also serve another purpose. These moments lower our guard. In addition to creating an atmosphere that allows us to enjoy our time with this cast, it also got me quite anxious on my initial watch. Just knowing the premise of the show meant that these fun moments not only would not, but could not last for long. Eventually things would come crashing down, and just knowing that this is an inevitability, it made me cherish these moments as they were happening, and eventually miss them when they began to fade. But that's kind of the point, isn't it? It's essentially how we look back on our pasts, how we hold on to fun and nostalgic memories, and have a tendency to not think about the things that bothered us. If taken to the most extreme, memories can be altered or repressed, like in Yuki's case. The show is presented this way because it's how Yuki perceives it, and the rest of the cast depend on Yuki to act as a lens into this nicer reality. Honestly, despite the sort of tragic and messed up nature of this, it's kind of necessary to keep everyone sane and hopeful. You'll notice over the course of the show, when this chipper girl with the funny hat isn't present, everyone seems to fall into more depressed or unbalanced states. And upon Yuki's return, a balance is restored. Which, if I could conclude this segment, I would have to say balance is one of the most important elements in how Gakugarashi presents itself. Now, before completely moving on and wrapping everything up, I feel I should address some areas where the show stumbles. As I mentioned before, there's a bit lacking in Yuri's development compared to the rest of the casts. I think it's fine for the most part and she does develop overall, but I also realize she doesn't stand out as a character as a result. In reading the manga, I found she lost a bit of what made her interesting and it's unfortunate the changes negatively affected her in this way. Another thing I've noticed after many rewatches is there's sort of an awkward change in the show's pacing after everyone's backstories are established. The middle begins to drag on a bit and doesn't really progress too well for about 3 to 4 episodes. Not to mention there's that really weird out of place episode 9 that I would almost recommend skipping if not for some small plot points that are important to know for the next episodes. The animation is also nothing special really. It's not a huge problem as the show isn't too focused on action or fluid movements, but it's bare bones at best. It's also worth mentioning that when the show does resort to using CGI, it's not great. <laughs> also, while I really appreciate Gakugarashi's use of the moe aesthetic, it does tend to linger too long and is pretty divisive. An often common criticism of the show is that the themes can be too jarring. While the conflicting themes coexisting is something I enjoy, I realize this isn't the case for some people. And it may be really rough if this is an issue for you as it has a big presence in the anime overall. I do have a suggestion that you check out the manga if this does bother you. It's done with a bit more grit and a less intrusive clashing of tones. But in bringing up the manga a second time, it's also important to note that the anime is incredibly different in many ways. It sort of tells its own unique story, and while these more drastic changes allow for some things to work a lot better in my eyes, the plot becomes a lot messier as a result, particularly in the show's finale. Without bringing up anything specific, there comes a point where there's a solution to a problem that seems to just come out of nowhere and is a bit too convenient to take seriously. It results in a sort of Frankenstein's monster of different plot points from the manga being mashed together. This ending is probably the most infamous part of the anime. It's a decision I find hard to defend. <laughs> That being said, I do think it's unfair to say that the show ends badly, thanks mostly to how the cast's bond is handled, and more specifically how Yuki's character growth wraps up by the end. 
I'd like to try to explain why I feel this way without spoiling anything, which admittedly will be pretty difficult, so sorry if this is a bit vague. Backing up a bit, there comes a point where we learn what it was that triggered Yuki's delusional state, and it's after understanding what happened where we see the cracks begin to show. Whether it's due to someone's slip of the tongue, or Yuki piecing things together in her mind, maintaining her false perspective slowly becomes less and less feasible. But despite Yuki struggling, her personality at its core is consistent. She will not hesitate to help someone in trouble despite not fully comprehending what's going on. Because at the end of the day, Yuki is someone that tries. Yuki is someone that realizes she can make a positive impact, even if it's as small as maintaining an infectious smile and chipper attitude. But in her pushing all the negative thoughts into the recesses of her mind, she realizes that she's forgotten important things, memories she's wanted to cherish in spite of the overwhelmingly negative emotions that come with. It's in confronting her demons and trying to move on from this facade she's created where Yuki truly becomes an admirable character. Part of me hates to see Yuki lose her innocence, yet at the beginning I've always wanted her to figure things out and this scene left me engulfed in sadness but pride. And it's because of this progression that she's able to pass this lesson on to others. By giving in to her emotions and accepting reality, she's realized that the good and bad memories coexist and that it's okay to not always be okay. Emotional turmoil exists, but it's a reminder of the blissful moments. Loss hurts, but to completely forget that feeling means to forget what created such a strong feeling in the first place. Seeing Yuki learn this by the end and pass it on to her friends allowed me to take any extra punches to the heart and continue, to cry but also smile, to accept the bittersweet final moments and conclude feeling warm and hopeful. Gako Garashi is special to me for many reasons, some of which I barely scratched the surface on and some I haven't gotten to touch on in general, but one of the more major reasons I love this series as much as I do is that I can deeply relate to these emotional struggles. I obviously haven't reached the same levels of disconnect as Yuki, but with all of the terrible things going on in the world and with some personal issues I have struggled with, I often find myself ignoring things, just pushing all the negatives out of the frame and putting the blinders on. Sadly, this is something I feel many of us do without ever realizing. I mean, here I am indulging in my habit of making these super niche videos, and here you are watching. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to shame anybody, and I'm grateful you decided to give my video a look, but these are dilemmas that occupy my thoughts whenever I think about Gakko Garashi. I wonder if I'm any better than Yuki, and I've come to realize that I'm, I'm not. But what's beautiful about this situation is that Yuki represents what I'd like to become. That sort of growth has become a personal goal of mine. And while this may be my own personal attachment to the series, I feel there's something to gain depending on who you may relate to. All of these characters have their own struggles, and if you can envision yourself in their shoes, maybe the show can become important to you as well. Sorry for ending this on such a weirdly emotional note, but that's exactly what Gakko Grashi is to me. It's emotional. And it doesn't always make sense, but at the end of the day, I still understand it and love it. Yeah.